Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm Neelima Vaidula. I'm a breast medical oncologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital and a faculty member at Harvard Medical School. Today, I'll be discussing new advances for metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Here are my disclosures. Triple negative breast cancer has conventionally been defined as breast cancer that is estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative, and HER2 negative. It accounts for about 20% of all breast cancer cases. Triple negative breast cancer often behaves in a more aggressive manner with a higher propensity for distant metastases. The mainstay of treatment is chemotherapy. However, this is a difficult to control disease subtype often with chemo resistance and a poor prognosis. The median overall survival is about 15 months in patients who have metastatic triple negative breast cancer. However, in recent years, it appears that triple negative breast cancer is actually more of an umbrella term. Many different groups have performed molecular profiling of triple negative breast cancer. During molecular profiling studies, they have been able to identify multiple subtypes within triple negative breast cancer. Recently, um, a group led by Burstein et al. identified four different subtypes of triple negative breast cancer that have distinct molecular targets. They term these the luminal androgen receptor, mesenchymal, basal-like immunosuppressed, and basal-like immune-activated subtypes. They were also able to demonstrate that these subtypes have prognostic significance. The worst prognosis was seen in tumors that are basal-like immunosuppressed and the best prognosis for those tumors that are basal-like immune activated. They also identified a more indolent androgen receptor subtype that they termed the luminal androgen receptor subtype. Similarly, other authors have also been able to classify triple negative disease into varying subtypes. While there have been classification differences between studies, mainly due to the methodology and the subsets used, I think that while this may complicate ultimate definitions, cl clinically, what is most important is the identification of molecular targets that may have therapeutic relevance. So today I'll be focusing on a couple of molecular targets for triple negative disease that actually have FDA approved novel therapies. We'll be talking about immunotherapy that, um, that um, affects the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway, as well as antibody drug conjugates that um, bind to the trope 2 receptor and um, also LIV-1 and also talking about PARP inhibition with PARP inhibitors that target the DNA damage repair and replication pathway. But as you can see on this slide, there are a number of other novel targets, including the androgen receptor, the PIK3 AKT mTOR signaling pathway, and microtubule pathways that have also been studied and are undergoing further investigation in clinical trials. So starting with PARP inhibitors. We now have two PARP inhibitors that are FDA approved for the treatment of germline BRCA mutant metastatic breast cancer. A PARP inhibitor targets the DNA damage repair pathway. In a normal cell that does not have a BRCA mutation, DNA damage may be repaired both through homologous recombination mediated by BRCA and also base excision repair mediated by PARP1. However, in cells that have a BRCA mutation, the homologous recombination pathway is not intact, but DNA damage can still be repaired through PARP. In cells that have a BRCA mutation that receive a PARP inhibitor, both of these pathways are not intact, and as a result, the cell goes into catastrophic cell death, resulting in the efficacy of PARP inhibition in germline BRCA mutant cells. So the phase three Olympiad study evaluated Olaparib, a PARP inhibitor, in patients who have germline BRCA mutant metastatic breast cancer. As, seen on, as shown on this slide, the addition of Olaparib improved progression-free survival compared to chemotherapy. As a result of this study, Olaparib has now been FDA approved for the treatment of metastatic breast cancer in patients with germline BRCA mutations. 
Similarly, the Imbraca study was a phase three study that compared talisoprib versus treatment of physician's choice of chemotherapy. Again, in this study, there was an improvement in progression-free survival that was seen with talisoprib compared to standard chemotherapy. This led to the approval of talisoprib for patients with metastatic breast cancer who carry germline BRCA mutations. However, germline BRCA mutations only account for about five to 10% of breast cancer. This limits their applicability. These are well-tolerated oral drugs, so it is appealing to be able to use them in a larger patient population. One exciting area where we may potentially be able to apply PARP inhibitors is in patients who carry somatic BRCA mutations that are present in the tumor or in the blood. So this is actually some work that we did at our institution where we evaluated the presence of somatic BRCA mutations that are detected by cell-free DNA in patients with metastatic breast cancer. We found that of 215 patients with metastatic disease seen at our institution in a two-year period, nearly 14% of them had cell-free DNA BRCA mutations that were detectable by a 73 gene assay. The majority of these mutations were not associated with germline BRCA mutations. These were seen across breast cancer subtypes, including triple negative disease. In conjunction with our genetics counselor, with our genetic counselors, we were able to classify these mutations as those that are both known germline pathogenic, in other words, mutations that are likely to behave like germline mutations, and novel variants, those mutations whose significance is not known. We developed a CTC culture from a patient who had a pathogenic somatic BRCA1 mutation and were able to demonstrate sensitivity to a PARP inhibitor. So based on this work, we've actually designed an investigator-initiated clinical trial to study talisoprib in patients who have somatic BRCA mutant metastatic breast cancer. And in this exciting trial, we are enrolling patients with metastatic disease, including triple negative disease, who undergo cell-free DNA screening and are found to have a BRCA mutation in the blood. If these patients are not known to have a germline BRCA mutation, they're eligible for treatment with talisoprib, which they may continue until disease progression. And our primary endpoint is to determine the impact on progression-free survival. So this is an ongoing tr clinical trial that we have up and running at our institution and will soon open at six other academic centers across the country. So it's uh, potentially a great option for patients who have somatic BRCA mutant um, metastatic disease identified by cell-free DNA. Moving on to immunotherapy. So immun immunotherapy um, blocks the interaction of the program cell death one PD-1 receptor and program death ligand one, increasing anti-tumor immunity. The initial clinical studies in triple negative breast cancer with immunotherapy demonstrated a limited response to monotherapy, prompting combination studies. This brings us to the Impassion 130 study. This was a randomized study of patients with advanced triple negative disease in which patients were received either atezolizumab in combination with nabpaclitaxel or nabpaclitaxel alone. The co-primary endpoints of this study were progression-free survival and overall survival. The authors also performed a stratification analysis based on PDL1 immune cell status. What you see on this slide are the overall survival results in the patient population that was PDL1 immune cell positive. The addition of atezolizumab to nabpaclitaxel resulted in an improvement in overall survival. As shown on this slide, the median overall survival in patients who received atezolizumab and nabpaclitaxel was around 25 months compared to 17.9 months in the control arm. These compelling findings led to the FDA approval of atezolizumab and nabpaclitaxel for patients who have PDL1 positive, triple negative metastatic disease. The Keynote 355 study was a similarly designed study, this time looking at the combination of pembrolizumab in combination with chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. 
In this study, chemotherapy could include a taxane or gemcitabine and carboplatin. At the recent ASCO meeting, the progression-free survival results were presented from this study. Well, as shown on this slide, the addition of pembrolizumab to chemotherapy in tumors that were PDL1 positive defined by a CPS score greater than 10 resulted in an improvement in progression-free survival. The median progression-free survival in patients who received pembrolizumab was 9.7 months compared to 5.6 months in the arm receiving chemotherapy alone. Based on these findings, the FDA has approved the combination of pembrolizumab with various chemotherapy partners for patients who have PDL1 positive triple negative disease. However, Although we've had two positive studies looking at immunotherapy and chemotherapy combinations, it's worth mentioning that one study, the Impassion 131 study, was not a positive study. So this study looked at paclitaxel and um, atezolizumab and did not demonstrate a significant benefit in overall survival with the addition of atezolizumab to chemotherapy. We're still trying to understand what may explain this discrepancy. These findings may be due in part to the demographics of the patients who were enrolled in this trial, the chemotherapy partner used, and the use of steroids. That being said, for the time being, in my clinical practice, if I'm using atezolizumab, I tend to combine it with nab paclitaxel, avoiding paclitaxel um, to help maximize the benefit to my patients. And lastly, moving on to the um, antibody drug conjugates, I'm going to be discussing sasituzumab govitekin. Sasituzumab govitekin is a trope 2 antibody um, drug conjugate. Trope 2, also known as tropoblast antigen 2, is a glycoprotein that is highly expressed in all breast cancer subtypes, including triple negative breast cancer. Sasituzumab govitekin combines a trope 2 antibody, a linker, and SN38, which is an irinotekin derivative. The first studies that were done with this agent was a phase 1-2 study. And in this study, there was a progression-free survival of 5.5 months and overall survival of 13 months with um, sasituzumab govitekin. And that actually led to the initial FDA breakthrough drug designation um, for triple negative disease. This was followed up by a phase three confirmatory study of sasituzumab govitekin known as the ASCENT study. So in this study, patients with metastatic triple negative disease who had received at least two prior chemotherapies for advanced disease were randomized to treatment with sasituzumab govitekin or a chemotherapy of physician's choice. The study demonstrated an improvement in progression-free survival with sasituzumab compared to treatment of physician's choice. As shown on this slide, the median progression-free survival in patients who received sasituzumab was 5.6 months compared to 1.7 months in the arm receiving treatment of physician's choice, which was a statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival. Furthermore, an improvement in overall survival was observed with the addition of sasituzumab. The median overall survival was 12.1 months in the arm receiving sasituzumab compared to 6.7 months in the arm receiving chemotherapy. And so this was also a significant improvement. So based on these findings, sasituzumab govitekin should be considered as a standard therapy for patients who have metastatic triple negative disease and have received at least two prior therapies. So how do we put all this together? Um, when we think about patients who have metastatic triple negative disease, I think it's really important for patients to have their tumor tested for PDL1 as a PDL1 positive tumor may be a candidate for atezolizumab or pembrolizumab with chemotherapy. Patients should also have BRCA1-2 germline testing. If they're found to have a BRCA1-2 germline mutation, they may be a candidate for a PARP inhibitor. And in patients who have, whose tumors are both PDL1 negative and BRCA negative, certainly um, there's a whole host of chemotherapy agents that can be considered. On progression after initial therapy, sasituzumab govitekin should be considered as an option based on the compelling survival data. 
However, I think it's also important to think about tumor genotyping for patients with advanced triple negative disease. This is some work that we did at our institution comparing tumor tissue and plasma-based genotyping in patients with metastatic breast cancer. What we demonstrated was that high rates of actionable mutations were identified both with cell-free DNA and with tumor tissue genotyping. In particular, cell-free DNA seemed to identify a higher number of actionable mutations. Based on the presence of these mutations, patients were also treated with genotype-directed therapy or matched therapy at significantly high rates. And what's even more interesting was that in this analysis, we found that there may be a possible survival benefit of using matched therapy in patients who have actionable cell-free DNA mutations as shown in the survival curves here. This is a retrospective analysis and needs to be followed up with prospective studies, but both our group and other groups across the nation and internationally have demonstrated that there may be a benefit to using tumor genotyping in patients with metastatic disease. So it's something to think about. So in summary, triple negative breast cancer is a heterogeneous disease entity with varying molecular targets that may have therapeutic implications. At the present time, PARP inhibitors, immunotherapy, and a trope 2 antibody drug conjugate have entered our treatment framework. There are also ongoing studies of many other novel therapeutics which may in fact impact our future approaches, and tumor genotyping may help identify actionable mutations for therapeutic intervention. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to address any questions.